All right, we're going to go through um, sample proportions and the letter sections of um, inferential statistics for proportions. All right, so we've um, we've already covered inferential statistics for um, normally distributed variables, and um, it turns out under the um, central limit theorem, you can do this for proportions too, and we'll go through how we can do that shortly. All right. So, some examples covered in the book, the idea that, and we're usually talking about, we take a sum, all right, so sample proportion, you take a sample of people, and um, in this example, 100 students, and you find out how many of them are left-handed, it's 15, so it's 15%, you know, pretty simple. Okay, and that becomes a sample proportion. Okay, so the sample proportion is basically just taking an average. Um, but we, we are introducing a new symbol for this to distinguish it from other proportions. So um, it may not be the true proportions as say, okay, you've got uh, a, your sample of 100 students um, in her year level uh, and 15 uh, of them out of 100, that's 15%, but um, the true proportion might be larger or smaller than this. So there's only so much we can do with the uh, sample size that we're given. So notice that you've also, the sample proportion, you use the symbol here, uh, the, I often call this uh, P hat. Uh, it's P with a tilde sign over the top. That's a sample proportion. So if you see that symbol, distinguish that as a sample proportion. It's a bit like in uh, normal statistics we had, um, so you took your sample mean. So if I drew my sample mean sign here, so you have your X bar, that's your sample mean. And P hat is your sample proportion. So they're, they're analogous, but so there's a few, obviously, there's a few differences of how that's applied and uh, what we need to do with it. And there's a few little differences in what, um, there's a lot of similarities, but a, a number of differences you have to be aware of when we're going through this. Okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> okay, so we can actually calculate the mean and standard deviation of um, a sample distribution. So, um, the mean itself, I'm just going to come to the summary. Uh, the population proportion P, uh, the sample proportion P hat. All right, the mean is actually P hat, and the standard deviation is uh, this was given here. So we'll do a practice problem in a minute in relation to this. <clears throat> but, okay. Now, all right, in where were we going with this? This is all pretty simple so far. We've done stuff like this already. Um, but we're going to use this in order to do inferential statistics. So carry out a confidence interval and um, similar things that we've done with uh, continuous variables. Okay, now in this case, we actually have a particular rule. So when we talked about central limit theorem with normal distributions, it was the idea that if X was um, normal, then X bar N is also normal. And if X is not normal, then basically X bar large N sample size was approximately normal. This one actually has a number. <clears throat> so if N times P is greater than five and N times bracket one minus P close bracket is greater than five. If both of those are true, you can say it's approximately normally distributed enough to apply the normal um, approximation, and that's what we're going to do. So the reason for this is, okay, well, um, NP, well, what if P was very high, very likely that it was going to occur? Well, that will satisfy this one, but it may not satisfy that one. And conversely, if something was very unlikely, then one take P would be a number higher than one. You could have a a relatively small value of N that would satisfy this inequality, but not that one. So it has to be um, it has to be uh, satisfied both. And as you can probably tell from that, the, the distributions that have a P close to one half um, can, can satisfy both of these with a smaller N. In fact, the, uh, if you had P was one half, uh, your N would have to be 10. So if you had 10 and P, and P of a half, that would satisfy both of these because it'd be exactly five each. Okay. <clears throat> So let's, I'm going to go and I'm actually going to find a problem. Um, let's do question five. Okay, so we've got five 
seventh of a household in a country town are known to own computers. Let P be the sample proportion of households in the town, let the sample size be 200. Okay. So in this case, we actually find sometimes you're given like a, a actual sample, they would say, instead of saying five sevenths, they would say, okay, this many out of 200, and you have to work out P. All right. So, okay, let's have a look. So in this case, let's actually make, give us a bit more space. Okay. All right. Okay, so looking at question five. Alrighty. Question five. All right, we've got a P hat equals uh, five sevens. All right. And um, that is our, also our mean, in, in this case, that's also the mean. All right, so we actually have to work out the standard deviation in that. That is, that is, that is the mean. All right, now our standard deviation. Okay, let's go up to a former. So our standard deviation is P uh, times one take P divided by N. And the square root of that. All right, so let's have a look. Let's put in the square root of. All right, so we got five sevenths times one take five sevenths. Over 200. All right. So, I mean, you can stick that in your calculator, and um, I happen to have mine next to me, so I'll just crunch that in. You can reduce that down. I don't think, I might work out to be something nice, but I, I doubt it. Let's have a look. All right. <clears throat> so, five sevenths times bracket one minus five sevenths. All right, divided by 200, and the square root of that. Okay, it's so approximately square root 5 on 70, but I'll just I'll express that as a uh, decimal. All right. And I should have prepared earlier. All right, but I'm just, I'm just doing these randomly, just picking ones I like. All right, um, so we got about... Uh, all right. Zero point... Okay, zero, three, one, nine to three cent fits. Okay, so we've actually got a mean and standard deviation. Now, basically, um, we're just gonna summarize how you would approach the rest of them. Uh, okay, is it normally distributed? Well, let's have a look. Actually, let's do this test. Okay, so we've done part A. Uh, we'll do part B and we'll explain how part C, because part C is basically applying um, Oh, we'll, we'll go through, we'll mention it in a minute. Okay, so let's just go through this one at a time. Okay, is, um, let's maybe make ourselves a bit more space. Okay. All right. So, puppy. All right. So, the test is, okay, we need to know what NP is. Well, NP is 200 times by five sevenths. Okay. All right. So that's uh, basically a thousand over seven. Let's just do that. One thousand over seven. <clears throat> okay, that is well and truly above what we need. Okay. I should probably put a bunch more signs. I'll do that. All right, so that's one, four, three. Three cent figures, which is greater than equal, uh, greater than five. All right, and uh, n one minus p is two hundred times by four sevenths. That's smaller, but is still going to be pretty big in comparison to five. All right, so then we've got eight hundred over seven, and eight hundred seven is one hundred fourteen approximately. The three cent figures again. This is not. 
Um, are we just using this as a test and compare it to 15? So the answer is uh, yes. Um, approximately no. Okay, so that's fine. All right, so let's have a look at uh, question C. All right, let's scoot that over. Okay, enlarge this a little bit. Okay, you can estimate the probability that in a sample of 200, between 72% and 73% inclusive of households um, owns a computer. Now, since it is normally distributed, you can actually use a normal approximation for this. So basically, you can take your mean and standard deviation, put it into um, an NCD calculation, and have the lower bound be uh, 0.72 and the upper bound being 0.73 and that will be fine. That works. So that's how you could approach this. Um, it's probably the best way to approach it since uh, that's the that's what we're doing here. So I'm just going to leave that one for you to try. Okay. So we, we're going to rush through um, the basically the, the remaining part of the content. Okay. So where are we going with this? All right, so we can now uh, we can now apply a Kong's interval to this because um, if we can normalize these, we can apply what we did for the normal distributions and the continuous variables, and we have a different formula now for a Kong's interval. So you notice here we got our this is our left bound of a Kong's interval, and that's our right bound. And our happy little 1.96, which is um, related to the 95% confidence, is in there as well. So basically, that is our mean minus. 1.96, and look at this. This is our standard deviation. It is the same formula that we use for comms intervals for uh, normals, but we're just taking the, um, what we just fit, or what we just uh, used before to work out a mean and standard deviation. All right, so let's let's skip over the, okay, so there's actually, um, okay, you can, you can use this formula to carry it out, and you can also use, um, the calculations in here. I might write it out both ways, um, but I will check it with um, with my Casio. All right, I don't have my emulator with me at the minute, so um, I'll just have to uh, punch it up and you have to trust me. Uh, or try for yourself, of course. Okay, so we're just going to, I mean, we can do uh, examples of these, but... <clears throat> okay. So we're actually going to apply a test with one of these. So I might even pick this number seven one here. Okay. So the political party uh, DNT asked 1,000 people electorate how they would vote in an upcoming election. 39% uh, said they would vote for DNT. An independent pollster found that 1,360 people out of 4,000 surveyed said they would vote for DNT. Um, now, this business about sample sizes uh, actually becomes quite interesting uh, later on, but um, uh, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this one. Uh, I, I want one I can actually uh, test. Uh, I want to... We're going to skip choosing sample size. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So we're going to actually do one where we're testing. Okay, we're going to use intervals to make a claim about uh, proportion, actually. So we're going to actually apply what we know. We're going to go to here, um, and then we're going to go back to um, our portion size. Okay. Okay, so, all right. So let's just take the first one, for example. Nice, simple one. Okay, uh, to see, to test if a coin was fair, it was tossed 200 times and 91 heads appeared. Okay, it doesn't seem very, very fair, but for 200, you spend something closer to 100 for the average amount. All right, find the sum of proportion of times uh, the coin landed heads. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, let's put all this. All right. So question one. All right, so our p hat, so this one we actually have to find p hat equals uh, 91 over 200. All right, 
what would you expect the um, population of the Porsche? So the population proportion, the, the coin was fair, I would expect that to be 100 or, or 100 over 200 and thereby, um, if it was fair, P should equal um, 0 0.5, because then 100 over 200 is a half. Okay, construct a 95% confidence interval for P. So let's actually put that into the formula. All right, so we'll write this out. Then I'm just going to do the calculation. You can use your graphics calculator to check yourself. All right, so we've got 91 over. It's worth your while writing these out just in case, like for the exam, just in case you happen to make an error of your calculation. So if you just write out the calculation, then um, if you made an error, you've got nowhere to go from there. The, the examiner is not going to know what you did if you just write out numbers on, a, on, a, on two boundaries. All right, so we've got 91 over 200 times 1 minus 91 over 200 over 200 okay um, and I see the other boundary that is between the true population and um, well you get the other side it's the other side but plus okay uh, I'll, I'll write it out anyway it's just to make a bit more space so let's just do, let's put it this way. All right, so, there we go. All right, so 91 over 200 plus 1.96 times by ninety one over 200, one minus 91 over 200 over 200 <clears throat> okay so now I'm mean, you can use a Casio to do this so to do that you can go back to um, the instructions on the, um, the previous pages which showed you how to do that so just from uh, memory go into the stats section go into INTR interval Z 1p and what you're actually going to be entering in, you don't enter in p hat. It actually calculates that for you. The more important values are actually the uh, the number of positive returns and the sample sizes. So that's what it will ask you when you do a lot of these calculations. So you're going to put in x, which is 91, and you're going to put an n of 200. Okay, and that's your that's how you do your confidence level. So you check your boundary, make sure it's confidence level of uh, 95% or 0.95 in this one. Okay, so the boundaries. Okay, the boundaries are 0 0.386. Sorry, my calculator is not very uh, luminescent. Let's see if I can fix that. There we go, that's better. Okay, make sure you're, you can see your calculator in your exam. Okay, and uh, 0. Um, Five to four. Okay, interesting. All right, so that's our confidence interval. Now, based on this confidence interval, would you say the coin is fair? Um, now, interesting that zero point five. Okay, so zero. So you can't say the uh, the, the CI. is not, oh, I should actually rephrase that. Let's rephrase that. Okay, so it, the, the answer is, um, is inconclusive. Okay, because um, 0 0.5, so the um, predicted value is not outside um, the confidence interval. Okay, thereby, the, we just don't know. Okay, so we don't know if it's fair. Um, we, we definitely can't say it's not fair. We can't say that it is an unfair, like it's a weighted coin or something. So we, we can't tell. All right, it's not so, uh, so it's, um, uh, cannot, 
cannot claim coin is unfair. At the 95% level. Okay, so that's all you can really say at that point. It, it might be fair, um, we, we need to get the more information. Like we need to flip this coin um, like 2,000 times and maybe that will help. Okay, so, all right. Anything else? No, that's really it. Now let's go into sampling, so um, sample sizes. So this is something, I'll leave this one to last because there's something a little bit special about uh, this one makes it, that sets it aside from um, what we did with normals. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Choosing the sample sizes. <clears throat> okay, so a bit like the one for normal distributions, you can, you can come up with a formula for width, the width being the width of your confidence interval, and you can come up with, you can rearrange that into uh, express for n. Um, now, the interesting thing is with this one, uh, the proportion actually becomes a feature of this. So, uh, okay, so basically your formula is this. Now, you notice that they've removed the p hat and they put a p asterisk. Okay, now, think about this. So, if I was to, um, I'm just going to take, if you notice this little part of the formula, so this part we're familiar with, 2 times 1.96, that used to be a standard deviation there, that got pulled out, yeah, that, the standard deviation is here, like the square root of p, 1 take p over n, um, that got pulled out, it's got squared, uh, so the square root is gone, and it's this part, is, um, it's the variance. Okay, now why have they done p star? Well, p hat is the sample proportion. But what if you didn't have a sample proportion? What if you did not know any information going into uh, collecting this information? So say if you want a width um, and you had no inclination as to what the proportion might be, then um, you actually have to maximize this. Now, if you think about it this way, if I was to take that, I'm actually going to write them in terms of x. So I'm going to say, okay, we have x. Now. Okay, so we had x bracket 1 take x. Okay, now see so that's a quadratic, so it expands out to be this x squared take x. Now, if you graph that, okay, it has um, it passes through 0 and it passes through 1. Okay, I guess where its vertex is. One half. Okay, so basically, in terms of p, n is maximum when p is one half. All right. So the idea of the the idea of p star. Okay. So p star or p asterisk. So yeah, I think some people call it p asterisk. I call it p star, just like I call I call p tilde a p hat. Um, so p star equals p hat. Now, anything, if p hat is known, all right, and then equals 0 0.5. So if we don't know what p hat is, otherwise. Okay. Now that actually makes it a very interesting um, thing for calculating the n. Um, so let's see if we can find an example here. Okay, this one for example, they've done a, um, a sample, they've done one example 14. Let's have a little quick look at this example. Okay, historically a medical procedure has been successful for 80% of patients treated. A new procedure has been tried. A 95% confidence interval of which 4% is needed to estimate the probability of success of the new procedure. How many patients should be tested? Okay, now they've, they've put in the numbers and you can see P star, they've used the 80% 0.8 proportion that was known beforehand. Now, if, okay, so you're rounding that and um, you round up to the nearest, uh, well in this case, they've actually rounded to the nearest 10. 
uh, and three simple figures. I would, um, yeah, I'll round to the nearest person. Um, or if you, hopefully the exam question is this out of something that's out of 100, so it doesn't matter, so you're not rounding to um, the nearest 10. Uh, but you would always round up because you need to be um, have a width smaller. If you have a larger end, you have smaller width. So, okay, to satisfy the width, um, you round up. Okay, so now a question, this is not in the example, but a question I will pose is what if you didn't know about this 80%? Okay, so let's just do a little recal. So if I did a little recalculation of that, if the 80% was not known, Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, get my pen up. All right, so I'm doing a recalculation. If P star equals um, 0 0.5, okay. Now I want a width of 0 0.04. All right, so N equals 2 times 1.9, oops, 9.6 squared. So all squared, but over the width of 0 0.04. Okay, give us a little more root. Times by, okay, then P starts to have 0.5, and 1 and minus 0.5 is also 0.5. Okay. Okay, so if I do a calculation of that, what do I get? All right. All right, so 2 times 1.96 divided by 0.04. All right, square that, times by a half, times by a half. Okay, so I need 2,401 persons. So you can see... With having that prior knowledge about that 80%, you needed significantly less people to obtain the width you needed. And wh where this goes is you might have a question where um, you have a preliminary small sample that gets you a P which is significantly far away from 50%. So it might be very low or very high. The higher or lower, the smaller the sample size you need for a particular width. Um, in this particular instance, of course, you need to have a sample size large enough so that you can um, satisfy the normal um, normal limits and such. But um, if you had a small sample size, so if you had 100 people, and so if you say, I'll put that as a sample, okay. So if you had 100, if you had 100 people, so you had n equals 100, and that got you, a p hat of 0 0.8, then that would mean n, then you'd have your n of 1537, like in the question, I'm using the example, the question example again. So that would mean you'd have a total p um, amount of people of 100 plus 100, um, 1537. So about um, a little bit over uh, 1600 people, 640 people. Um, so you notice that that is actually significantly less than this very large 2,401. So the point I'm trying to bring across with this, with these sample sizes, for proportions, it can be, um, if you feel that, if you don't start off with a P hat value to begin with, uh, and you feel that proportion is going to be somewhere that's either going to be significantly higher than 50% or significantly lower than 50%, it's actually a smart thing to get a small sample first, work out a p hat from that, and then plug that into here to work out how large, or into here rather, to work out the sample size you need um, for a certain width, so that you don't have to over sample. Because remember, um, the larger the sample, the higher the cost. If you if you're doing this um, as in a real statistic sense. All right, so. We'll see if there's any other particular questions in here. Uh, so this, this question four kind of goes to that um, idea. They look at comparing, they'll, they'll compare the two ones involving uh, a P star of uh, 43 over 198 and P star of one half. And you, you'll find that this is going to have a significantly um, reduced sample size. Uh, 
so, and, and um, okay, so that, that is a, there's, if you go through question four, you'll find that um, this is a, a good way to go about it. So this is the, the example for B2 would be if you wanted to get a, a 0 0.04 width and you had no previous information about the apple sales or like the apples that were not fit for sale. All right, I think I'm going to leave it here. So try some of those yourself and see how you go.